Audrey Tang is Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, open government, and youth engagement. She is Taiwan's first transgender cabinet minister, and she became the youngest minister in the country's history at the age of 35. Audrey Tang is known for civic hacking and for strengthening democracy using technology. Audrey plays a key role in combating foreign disinformation campaigns and in formulating Taiwan's COVID-19 response. Audrey, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us again at an Oslo Freedom Forum event. And I, I'd like to start off by asking you, as digital minister, you work closely with civil society and, and you encourage them to contribute to and to participate in Taiwan's democracy. Technology's played a, a very important role and Taiwan's digital democracy has, has grabbed the world's attention, especially in the January 2020 elections in Taiwan. How, how does technology, along with open governance, along with transparency, protect democracy and help push back against foreign influence campaigns? Thank you for the great question. In Taiwan, we managed to counter the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedown, thanks to digital democracy. In a digital social innovation, we have three pillars, and that's fast, fair, and fun. On the fast part, we ensure that anybody who detects a disinformation online, even on end-to-end -end encrypted channels, they can flag it, not to the authorities, but rather to professional journalists, as well as civic technologists running a crowdsourced fact-checking project that anyone can join. And then once this gets detected, for example, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing gets upvoted this way on the public forum PTT, we decided that it was not disinformation after all, because it looks very legit. And then the medical officers immediately took the quote, seven new SARS cases, unquote, to heart, and then started the health inspection for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan the very next day, which is the first day of 2020. And so the collective intelligence not only enables a fast response from the Central Epidemic Command Center that live streams the uh, responses every day, but also through toll-free lines like 1922 and chatbots, any new ideas coming in from civil society, for example, a boy who calls and says, oh, you're rationing mask, but all I get is pink medical mask. I don't want to wear it to school because I'm afraid my classmate may laugh at me. The very next day in a live stream, everybody, the medical officers and the minister wore pink medical masks uh, to show solidarity and gender mainstreaming. And so in this way, our counter infodemic response, the humor over rumor emphasizes that for each disinformation campaign that travels on outrage, we always uh, push out a meme uh, that travels on joy. And joy has a higher R value than outrage. And so we can ensure that people vaccinated, that is to say, to see something hilarious um, before they actually see the disinformation package and therefore will not share it uh, in act of outrage. The foreign interference, for example, on attacking our election systems is countered this way, also through radical transparency of the YouTubers literally live streaming uh, the counting process in the ballot boxes, and a disinformation about mask distribution is uh, countered through a radical transparency effort done by civic technologists, the people queuing in line in the pharmacies can swipe their national health insurance card and actually see that the map reflects every 30 seconds the real-time availability in that pharmacy and so on. And so by radically trusted citizens, we counter both the infodemic and the pandemic through building mutual trust. Well, that's both inspiring and, and um, I, I just wish that this could be adopted pretty much everywhere. I, I think you are very advanced in comparison to where other democracies are. And, and I, I really hope that other governments look to your government as both a source of inspiration and, and support in the struggle against foreign influence campaigns that can really be so 
um, damaging. We, we see this a lot with human rights defenders and what they have to deal with through either uh, troll farms or uh, bots. I, I want to uh, go to an article uh, from the Hong Kong Free Press from June uh, 2020. You mentioned that, quote, you think the pandemic served as an amplifier of two different governing models. Clearly, you're, you're making a reference to the stark and dramatic contrast between authoritarian dictatorship model and, and the free and open democratic society model. Why do you think that Taiwan's democratic system has not only flourished, but has also strengthened during this COVID-19 pandemic? In Taiwan, we do not make the false trade-off or dilemma between um, having to sacrifice economic growth uh, in order to counter the pandemic or that in order to um, make sure that everybody still enjoys the freedom uh, of doing business and movement and so on, we have to make sacrifices in terms of public health, right? The Taiwan's record uh, on both the counter pandemic and also recording GDP growth this year um, has been the top of the world. And so by showing people that instead of the government knows everything, uh, we instead say, um, in Mandarin, if you can do it, do it. Uh, the idea, very simply put, is that the economic sector as well as the social sector can call the shots when they see, for example, a better way of distributing a mask, first in the pharmacies, then in convenience stores through mobile apps, and then on kiosk and even vending machines and so on. And the government, far from uh, dictating anything, takes actively the piloted um, ideas and then just amplifies it through the support of real-time open API and open data. This is what I refer to as reverse procurement. That is to say, whenever a new idea gains legitimacy through democracy, the government even though it may resist that at first, for example, using traditional rice cookers um, and do not add water, and then you can disinfect the mask and reuse it for three to five times. This is very counterintuitive. But then um, after we actually confirm it in our Food and Drug Administration, our uh, CECC commander, Minister Chen Shizhong, actually demonstrated this procedure on a live stream conference. And later on, we heard from international academic uh, journals that it works for N95 too. And this essentially tripled our mask availability just by sharing this simple social innovation. And all this imbues into the civil society this idea that innovation does not need to originate from top down. It can come from grassroots, and that's the core of democracy. Again, incredibly inspiring. Rice cookers, that, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. I, I had heard about using an oven and, and doing a low temperature, but uh, rice cooker, that, that, that's terrific. I, I, I'm, I'm going to start looking into that. Um, you played a, a key role in leading the effort of your country's government in combating COVID-19. And as, as you keep mentioning, technology was a key component of this. What were some of your primary concerns when leading this effort? And, and how did you incorporate protections for privacy and, and individual freedoms in, into this plan? Has there been any tension between citizens' concern over, say, surveillance or contact tracing or uh, just general rights concerns and the government's use of big data to to fight the epidemic, the pandemic rather? In Taiwan, because we never declared either a lockdown or a state of emergency, all our administrative actions need to go through the oversight from the parliamentarians, including interpolations, public hearings, and such. And because of this constitutional restriction, we only make use of the data collection method already in place before the pandemic. We do not, as a rule, collect new data uh, in the name of the counter-pandemic effort. And this serves uh, a very good um, bridge 
into the civil society human rights um, organizations understanding because if we repurpose something that's already in place before the pandemic its privacy properties are more well understood for example when we do the mask rationing it's essentially the same procedure as receiving uh, recurring prescriptions from the pharmacies. When we collect those in the kiosk, it's essentially the same experience as filing your income or local taxes in the convenience store. For example, the digital quarantine, uh, where the phone, instead of asking people to install anything that communicates over Bluetooth or collects GPS data or Wi-Fi or anything like that. Instead, we use a very rough estimate of the position of the phone using cell phone tower signal strengths that we are already using for early earthquake and flood warnings anyway. And so by reusing mechanisms that's already in place, we make sure that the human rights organizations can better communicate with the CECC, the command center, and the approval rate, for example, about the CECC's uh, digital quarantine measures uh, was at 91%. And we thank the 9% for asking the MPs for us to have to do a interpolation and explanation session, after which the polls show approval rate grows to 94%. And of course, we thank the 6% for keeping us honest and accountable. That's, that's, it's really wonderful to hear someone in, in, in government um, say, keep us honest and uh, accountable. Uh, again, I, I, I'm, it's very inspiring. And, you know, at the Oslo Freedom Forum, in, in past Oslo Freedom Forums, and actually already in this one, we've had several speakers discuss how um, Chinese tech companies could threaten uh, the digital rights and human rights of, of users. And I'm going to quote again from an article in uh, the Nikkei Asian Review where, where you were quoted as saying, putting Chinese equipment in a country's core telecom infrastructure is akin to inviting a Trojan horse into the network. Can you, would you kindly elaborate a little bit more on this? What are s some of the recommendations that you would provide to governments and to private citizens on, on this front, around the subject? The Trojan horse uh, metaphor, I did not create that. I was merely relaying the consensus on the street when we occupied the parliament back in 2014. It's called the Sunflower Movement. At that time, the students and people who are concerned about the so-called cross-strait service and trade agreement occupied the parliament for three weeks and each MPO in one corner of the occupied parliament deliberated on the street one particular aspect each of the CSSTA. And one of the deliberations there was about core communication infrastructure components made in the PRC, that's People's Republic of China regime, um, in the 4G communication network. So that Trojan horse metaphor was not uh, coined because of 5G. Rather, it was coined uh, six years ago uh, for the 4G deployment. And the consensus on the street was that the overall total cost of ownership of having to re-evaluate whether a supplier has been taken over by the Dang, the Chinese Communist Party, through one of its embedded party branches in every large enterprises in the PRC jurisdiction is too high. Because if you choose any particular component for your 4G network, it's likely that for 5G and other extended long time evolution networks, you will be using components from the same suppliers as well. And so for each and every upgrade, you have to do another systemic risk assessment of whether it has been de facto taken over by the Chinese Communist Party. And so amortized is actually more expensive than using, say, Nokia or Ericsson components. And so the decision on the street and also in the National Communication Commission was made back then, uh, six years ago. 
And so we've been enjoying so-called clean paths in our 4G network and now 5G this year uh, with no PRC components and we're thriving. So obviously, I think this is a consensus regardless of party affiliations uh, in the Taiwan public. That's that's spectacular. You you mentioned the sunflower movement. Now this is the correct me if I'm wrong, the, the March 2014 sunflower movement. And, and this was when hundreds of uh, people demonstrated against a, a trade deal with the CCP in China due to concerns of increasing China's authoritarian influence in uh, a young, democratic, sovereign, free nation like Taiwan. Um, given your activist roots, what advice or, or what tips, suggestions do you have for activists, specifically those activists that are pushing back against authoritarianism? As uh, Buckminster Fuller have said, um, the best way when you see a broken system is not exactly to try to repair the system. Instead, innovate, think of a new system that renders the old one obsolete. Indeed, in the sunflower movement, we have seen a polycentered, maybe 20 different NGO, each have their own center, uh, and with horizontal connection enabled by the internet, later on, we will see a very similar configuration in the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Now, fast forward a few years um, in the anti-ELAP protest, instead of 20 centers, we're now seeing maybe 2,000 centers. Um, each and every single person can start a flash mob or to compose Make Glory to Hong Kong together with a uh, essentially ad hocracy um, on LIHKG and other connected places. And these give people a taste of what it feels like to live democracy day to day. It's not just uploading three bits every four years to a ballot box, which is called voting, still very important, but far more interesting and important is to co-create reasonable things, solutions, decisions that we can all live with. And people who participate in this kind of co-creation, their minds gets changed that whenever people feel anger, they no longer turn the anger into helplessness, but rather into social outrage, which is an impulse for co-creation. And so my main suggestion is to not take this personal, but take it social. That's, uh, you, you, uh, I think one word we could add to that is hope, which is the opposite of helplessness. And if I could, you know, you just mentioned Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong uh, look to Taiwan as an inspiration due to Taiwan's own history of transitioning to democracy after having been an authoritarian country, um, which is often a, a reminder to people who have this silly idea that a country like, for instance, China under the CCP must remain a dictatorship because they're built that way. Yet, in fact, Taiwan proves that you can make that shift. Um, and Hong Kong is in a, in a precarious situation. What, what do you think are some of the other lessons, especially regarding digital democracy and innovation, that Hong Kongers can learn from the Taiwanese and vice versa, uh, maybe as a, uh, by the same token in, in terms of hope and helplessness, what have the Taiwanese learned from Hong Kongers? Well, in terms of the quote, be water, unquote, leaderless form, or, well, more than 2,000 leaders, so it's not very countable anyway, might as well be leaderless uh, form of uh, social organization. I think anywhere from Taiwan to Barcelona to everywhere in the world is learning from Hong Kong. They are definitely at the forefront of this uh, be water form of activism compared to which the sunflower is but a seed, uh, a prototype. So we are all learning from Hong Kong. Uh, and also uh, in the early days of Taiwan's young democracy, as you mentioned, when we just lifted the martial law in the 80s, uh, we rely in large part on the freedom of the press 
especially international correspondents, uh, journalists, and so on in Hong Kong to help working out what uh, we have not learned because of systemic authoritarianism in the dictatorship era in Taiwan. Uh, and so that greatly sped up Taiwan's democratic activists outreach to the world through the help from the journalists and activists in Hong Kong. And so we have been, I guess, returning the favor um, in the past few years uh, when Reporter Without Borders uh, moved their headquarter to Taipei uh, when the Oslo Freedom Forum <laughs> uh, sets up uh, physically in Taipei um, and many other events such as these as well. We made sure that the Hong Kong people can safely in Taiwan not only share their experience, but also, as you mentioned, radiate a message of hope that if the liberal democratic countries all keep our eyes a watchful um, coalition on the Hong Kong situation, then it will not deteriorate. It will not suffer uh, because of neglect. And that role Taiwan's very much willing to play in uh, addition to offer, for example, student uh, exchange and safety programs and so on. We have a special office for this. Well, if we can take a, a, a view, if we can um, scope out from Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and talk about other liberal democracies, how do you think they can better adapt to the rise of authoritarianism? Yeah, I think uh, we need not only to play defensive here, but also aggressively make sure that the innovations, what we call the Taiwan model, that you can take care of the economic growth without restricting essential freedoms. That is a very powerful message to share and exchange with the world. Recently, uh, the Czech Republic's um, head of the Senate uh, visited Taiwan and declared that, uh, and I quote, uh, I am Taiwanese, unquote. Um, well, paying kind of homage to uh, the Ich bin ein Berliner um, quite a few decades ago, um, because they also agree with this message, right? The message that with the proper co-creation across sectors in a society, we do not have to polarize or divide among ourselves just because we're a liberal democracy. Rather, we can ensure that everybody plays a role in the social mobilization against the pandemic and also the infodemic. And so that is the main message that we want to send. And for more, uh, consult Taiwan can help that us. Wow, um, Audrey, uh, this has been superb. You, uh, you really have, we packed so much in, into, this, into this fireside chat. I hope that the next time we meet, it, it'll be uh, next to a real fire somewhere in, in Norway, or when we do the next uh, regional Oslo Freedom Forum in uh, Taiwan. So uh, thank you so much, Audrey Tang. Thank you so much. Uh, we are great admirers of the role you play and uh, we will continue to sing the praises of a government that truly understands individual rights and not only stands for human rights in, in Taiwan and fundamental freedoms, but for these throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Cool. Wonderful. Okay. Well, no, that was just the rehearsal, right? We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again, right? <laughs> Yeah, that was stress rehearsal, right? <laughs>